Good evening, and thank you for joining us for part two of the Paul Mirage School of Business Dean Suite Speaker Series, where we're highlighting the important work being done by our alumni and community members on the front lines of this global health crisis. And I'm Eric Spangenberg, Dean of the Paul Mirage School of Business, and I'm pleased to welcome two alumni guests tonight, Dr. Philip Richardson and Dr. Diana Ramos. And I would like to take a moment to properly introduce each of them. Dr. Richardson is a practicing board certified anesthesiologist at PIH Health and now serves as the physician leader for PIH's COVID-19 response. Dr. Richardson is an anteater through and through having completed his undergraduate medical school, residency, and his healthcare executive MBA at UC Irvine. Having been in practice for over 20 years, he's had the honor to serve as a medical group CEO, board member of Chalk Children's, and a chair of the hospital, state, and national committees. Dr. Richardson currently serves as the community service chair of the Dean's Leadership Circle Executive Board. Welcome, Philip. We're glad to have you here tonight. Thank you, it's my honor to be here. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ramos. Dr. Diana Ramos is a national public health expert, adjunct assistant clinical professor at the Keck University of Southern California School of Medicine, physician for the Kaiser Permanente Medical Group, and current president of the Orange County Medical Association. She's the public health medical officer for the California Department of Public Health, Maternal, Child, and Adolescent Health, where she serves as the California Women's Health Medical Expert. Dr. Ramos, received her medical degree from USC with honors and completed her residency training in obstetrics and gynecology at the LA County USC Medical Center. She obtained her master's degree in public health from UCLA and received her BA in communications from USC. She is currently completing her executive MBA at the Paul Mirage School of Business here at UCI. Dr. Ramos was recently selected to the DLC due to her outstanding contributions to the Mirage School both in and outside of the classroom. Thank you for joining us, Diana. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, great, let's kick this off with our first question. And the first thing I would just ask is, uh, and I'll start with Diana since I just had you on the screen. Uh, I'm curious to know what your day-to-day -day has looked like recently. I mean, leading during this time is probably a bit chaotic. What, what's a day look like for you? Uh, that's a great question, and every day is a different day. There is no no standard um, from WebEx meetings, uh, Zoom meetings that we're all inundated with, not only statewide, local, um, national, but um, trying to keep up with that. And in addition, as you mentioned, I'm finishing my MBA, my executive MBA, and trying to keep up with all of those assignments as well is really uh, keeping me busy. But it's it's a dynamic time, and it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to to be leading during this time. So who who are you? You're you're face to face in some of your day, and then you're zooming. Who are you? Who are you face to face with, and who are you zooming with? So when I am working as a labor laborist uh, for Kaiser, I am there in the hospital. That's not every day, and I zoom with uh, statewide. Uh, initiatives, uh, programs that are being developed. In particular, my emphasis is women and children. So coming up with recommendations as to what information should be shared for uh, women in pregnancy, how are we gonna reinvent or make recommendations to uh, deliver healthcare uh, during this time and giving input for hospitals uh, for labor and delivery as to you know, what is the testing gonna look like? What can we do to improve health and the safety of not just the mom because we have a baby as well. Right, right. Well, it'll be interesting. I'm sure we'll come back around to that. Philip, what's your day look like right now? No, I, I would echo exactly what Dr. Ramos said is that it's, it's rather variable. It used to be much more clinically oriented and then uh, we saw about a 70% decrease in our surgical volume, so a lot of administrative tasks kind of took over and it's you know the zoom meetings remotely around the state and nation and then also you know listening to the different hospitals and seeing what's going on doing a lot of listening to understand what the problems are and trying to figure out the best solutions for those and it is interesting to have all these debates on how, how to craft guidelines and suggestions to help the medical staff or the anesthesia community 
best respond to things. It's it's always interesting to see the debate when there's very little science and lots of opinions. Well, I, I, I can echo that. It does seem like there's a lot of opinions uh, that are being that are being thrown around. And I, and I hope we can, uh, we, that's why we were so happy to have you two on here is to get a little bit of expert opinion, at least, and at least some firsthand knowledge of what's going on. And uh, I, I'll ask you, Dr. Richardson, what uh, what do the hospitals look like in Orange County, and, and and then maybe beyond that? I mean, if you're communicating with your colleagues elsewhere outside of Orange County, um, I, I don't know. Yeah. Talk maybe both of you can talk about are those who have coronavirus being treated effectively? Are the hospitals inundated? Are they empty? I mean, what's it look like for us around here, and then more broadly in the state and elsewhere? So at PIH, we have three facilities, one in Downey, Whittier, and then Good Sam's in downtown LA. And generally, they're, they're pretty empty. The census in Whittier, exactly, has been the lowest that it's ever been, you know, that, that I can recommend or see that we've ever had. Speaking with my colleagues at UCI, Hogue, St. Joseph's, Chalk, um, it's, it's all the same. The hospitals are, are very empty. Um, Mayo Clinic is going to post a three billion dollar loss just from the lack of volume that they've had, and all the hospitals are more or less in the same situation. With regard to treatment, most of it's supportive care. We're trying to work out the different uh, modalities. We had the hydroxychloroquine experiment, which I think we're continuing a lot of those studies. However, there's been some that suggested it's not very effective. Uh, Folks tend to have a cytokine storm. Your body kind of has this overreactive immune response. So using the IL-6 blockers has shown to be helpful. The most helpful so far has been the remdesivir study. Uh, as everyone's probably heard by now, that's been approved by the FDA at this point, and that Gilead's donating 140,000 uh, doses out to the US to distribute the way they see best. Uh, other than that, it's mostly supportive, just uh, high flow oxygen for folks. We used to think that we needed to put a breathing tube in sooner than later. Uh, that's kind of changed as we get more information and as you know, the data is more robust, we're learning now that we want to avoid putting a breathing tube in for as long as possible. So I think we're making good trend, good advancements, but there's no silver bullet yet. Dr. Ramos, do you have anything to add from your perspective as to how things look from you, where you're at? Yeah, so looking at the Orange County specific data, you know, they have an outstanding website. So if anybody's actually interested in looking at more close data, you can see that we actually have a trend going down in overall uh, hospitalizations in general, as well as ICU bed usage, which is really good. And looking at that data, not only here in Orange County, but statewide, is what has um, encouraged or had the governor announce today that we're actually moving into the phase two of his phase four plan to open up the state again. So because of the fact that we we're, we're, are, are able to decrease the um, hospitalizations and, and to test, uh, meet the criteria that he has set out, we're progressing to the next phase. And according to his press release on Thursday, uh, he's going to come out with guidance as to what is going to be the next phase uh, uh, in terms of opening of uh, businesses. So Friday, we're going to have more information. And from the preliminary in, uh, news brief that has been given, there's going to be its bookstores, flowers, <laughs> businesses that are going to be um, open. And they're going to be hopefully uh, progressively increased and get through this phase two which is a low, low risk uh, businesses to, um, to start to open up. And so we'll, we'll see, we'll see how we're going. So all of the, the usage as Dr. Richardson has echoed, you know, has said, has um, been very encouraging. We're doing a great job. And so because the usage and the hospitalization and the ICU beds are going down in terms of having patients, um, we're moving hopefully into opening up again relatively soon. 
So I'm curious when you say moving into opening up again and, 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 and Dr. Richardson, and I apologize, I refer to you both by your first names because, you know, actually Diana is in my class right now. She's one of my students and Philip was one of the students previously. So, you know, it's hard for me, but I got to remember to, to uh, provide the due respect to our guests here. But uh, Dr. Ramos, you, you mentioned opening up again, has the, has the sort of, low traffic meant um, impact on uh, work for people as well if it's also if it's also revenues for the hospitals is that so from the hospital perspective you know as dr richardson has said you know a lot of hospitals not just his system but many hospitals we're hearing numbers that hospitals are losing a million dollars a day so mm -hmm. from an economic standpoint especially because the elective surgeries have been canceled we oftentimes uh, don't realize that it is all the staff that was needed to, for those elective surgeries that um, is, is now furloughed. And so the hope is that once we start to open up again, um, you know, the uh, elective surgery and, and there's plans now that have been put out, not only by the governor, but, but the California Medical Association as to recommendations, how we can start opening up and scheduling uh, elective surgeries and we can turn that trend around. Yeah, absolutely. No, the CMS has some great guidelines. The CMA has got wonderful guidelines. And I think most of the hospitals in Orange County have started this week to resume the quote unquote elective surgeries. Now, I wouldn't say that's like turning, flipping the switch and putting everything back to normal. It's still just like as the governor is opening up, as Dr. Ramos pointed out, where you know it's a slow advancement. And similarly with surgeries, we don't, we want to still protect those high risk folks that are elder, have immunocompromised and so forth. But the young, healthy folks that you know, might be able to get something done now and avoid a more serious operation later, those are the things that we want to get going. So Dr. Richardson, you, you'd mentioned, you, you actually have some responsibility up in LA County, right? Yeah. And, um, it, did you see a big difference between LA County and Orange County as far as your facilities and, and the things that are happening or? Uh, I would say that the, the biggest uh, qualities that relate to COVID-19 are uh, population density and age. Uh, there's a, a whole host of other factors, but definitely where there's a high density population and an elderly population, those are most at risk. The Economist had a great article that actually looked at those as well as uh, several other uh, metrics and then more or less had a heat map. Fortunately, it showed California rather cool, but New York was very hot, uh, New Orleans, Florida, and, and those would be the, the spots that we're kind of predicting are gonna be trouble. I saw that, I saw that article actually, do you, um... I mean, a, a lot of, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the reason why people have tuned in here tonight is, is people are curious, you know, to hear where to get good information. Um, do you, do either of you recommend sort of best sources of information? Is The Economist a place to go? Is The Wall Street Journal? Is Financial Times? New York Times? Because you can spend your whole day reading these things. What are, what are your thoughts on that? I would say the CDC is is one of the best sources. Johns Hopkins is a is a fabulous source that pretty much everyone's uh, referring to to watch the the growth of trends. Uh, California Public Health has a fabulous website to show you exactly what California is doing, and then the different county public health sources are are also very useful. As Dr. Ramos pointed out, Orange County has a fabulous one. Um, yeah, and, and the ones that I go to pretty much daily are the American Medical Association, so for physicians, they compile everything for me in one spot from, from the medical perspective. So it has a John Hopkins, it has all of the, the medical um, sites. And the other one that I really like um, that I get the daily update for is the Wall Street Journal because they give me the economic, the business standpoint and how that relates with, with medicine, with healthcare and, and, and COVID-19. So those are those are my favorite, um, you know, additional sites other than the ones that Dr. Robertson mentioned. Okay, great. Yeah, probably the other thing to mention real quick would be the New England Journal as well as JAMA both have great sources and they are referencing, you know, anything COVID is free on their sites currently. And so they kind of put them all in one spot and it's easy to access to 
to the research that's coming out too. So uh, I, I want to move along here with another question um, that we thought of. We're you know heavily invested in the Mirage School with preparing and building leaders for a digitally driven world. And I imagine that digitally driven has taken on, uh, if not a completely new, at least a completely enhanced uh, meaning in, in this pandemic. And I wonder if there are new avenues that perhaps are not COVID related, but they're an offshoot of the COVID situation that telehealth providers are utilizing. I mean, how is healthcare changing? Uh, how's the administration of change going to be going to look for us moving forward. You know, Either I, one. Go I, ahead. Go ahead. Don. No. Okay. Uh, I think this has been the push that we in medicine needed because we have been very slow to change and to adopt technology. I mean, we are there's so much technology around us that we dragged our feet, and this has been the impetus to adopt and you could see the, the acceptance that people have not only patients, but physicians have adopted to providing medicine as well as receiving medicine. The, the convenience to be able to see a patient just like I am seeing all both of you, um, to be able to receive care, people are realizing, wow, that was actually pretty easy. And so the hope is from my perspective and from what I'm seeing, that insurers will continue covering it, providing the resources so that physicians, various healthcare providers can continue providing the care that, that we need. Um, right now, and, and Dr. Robertson can, can um, expand on it, right now anybody can, any physician can provide um, telemedicine without a HIPAA compliant platform. So right now that's why there's been such fast uh, adoption so you can use your 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 phone to be able to provide care your your zoom whatever whatever it is it doesn't have to be hipaa compliant but hopefully the adoption will continue and we actually too in women's health we are looking at new ways of providing prenatal care we're realizing wow do we really need all of those prenatal care visits how can we convenience our patients better so hopefully this will improve our quality as well as access to all patients. Well, and it would, it seems like it would also uh, decrease the cost as well, right? At least to the patients, I don't know. I mean, your time's still expensive, but the patient wouldn't have to go and, and the commuting and everything. Yeah, the, the one thing that I would add to is that you, you are not, um, you don't have the, the overhead, the medical assistant taking the vitals, and it really is oftentimes just directly the, the physician and the patient. Oh, I would echo all those. And I think that it's the, you know, as you, I think you said earlier, necessity is the mother in, of invention and being able to strip away those regulations of HIPAA uh, has really facilitated this change. Uh, during my MBA program, some of my classmates had, you know, business proposals of some of the technology to do the physical exam items. I haven't seen any of that come into play just yet but it wouldn't be a, a, that big of a stretch to be able to using you know your iphone to take some of those you know measurements you know trans upload your you know iwatch data so your your physician knows what your blood pressure is and your heart rate and all those kind of things to even add some of the physical exam that you know we're gonna we've been missing for the last couple of months but it will be an interesting new world yeah, I'm, I'm part of the Wayfinder Cove um, incubator and just to see how many of the startups that are in there, um, you know, have pivoted to address COVID. And so it's fantastic to be able to, to pivot um, very quickly. And, and again, the hope is to continue the adoption and implementation of, of all of the great uh, programs that are being developed right now. So I'm going to, speaking of pivoting, I'm going to pivot just a little bit to a, something that was brought up during our last, uh, I think we had a, we had a DL, Dean's Leadership Circle um, happy hour, Zoom happy hour, mm -hmm. and uh, we briefly talked about herd immunity, and I think that idea, the, I think I mentioned herd immunity knowing about as much about herd immunity as I know about 
astronomy, but, uh, but I, I thought that actually prompted us to have to sort of maybe bring this discussion online. Um, it, maybe you could, uh, the two of you could talk a little bit about herd immunity in relation to the coronavirus and, you know, elaborate for our viewers and me what that term means and, and what are the, what are the ramifications of achieving it and, or not achieving it? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to call on Dr. Richardson first on this one. Oh, I was going to ask Dr. Ramos to proceed, but uh, from, from, she's a public health background, but uh, just from, from my background, my understanding is that, you know, you only need a certain level of the population to be immunized, and then that helps prevent the spread of the disease. You can imagine there are some great uh, animations from the New York Times where you can see some balls pinging around, and as one ball hits the next one, it's passing along the infection. Now, that doesn't absolutely happen 100% of the time. It's, it's only, you know, depends on the viral load, and, you know, do they cough and sneeze and things like that. But you can imagine that if half of those little balls are immune, you know, and you only can transmit the disease in two weeks, you're, you're less likely to run into people. Another way to phrase it maybe is you're in a room of 100 people, and if half of those people are immune already, well, you're really in a room with only 50 people. And so it decreases the spread and allows everyone a little more time. But I bet Dr. Ramos probably has a better example of way of putting it together. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add to, that was a great explanation, but I'll just add that herd immunity is the concept that everyone in the population has been exposed to the disease, has built up antibodies. The way that you get those antibodies are either going to be through a vaccine or through actually getting the infection. And the more people that have the antibodies, that means that there's less people that who haven't been uh, either vaccinated or infected that can get the, the disease. Right now, the only thing, we don't have a vaccine for COVID, for COVID-19. So we have to, um, and, and that goes to some of the testing, look to see how many people actually have the antibodies. Um, and so uh, as, as the uh, number of people who have, have the antibodies increases, either through infection and eventually through a vaccine, then the, the um, number of new cases that you'll see of COVID-19 is going to go down. So that's the, you know, just adding to Dr. Richardson's explanation, the, the concept of herd, herd immunity. And the other example, classic one is measles. So measles, you know, everyone was vaccinated and we almost had the disappearance of the measles. We did temporarily, but then as less people were getting vaccinated, um, the number of cases were starting to increase because that immunity was no longer there through, through the vaccination, so. Right. And then one of the problems that, or speculations, because this is such a new disease, we don't have the information, we don't know. Uh, Harvard did a great study on how long are we going to be immune. A lot of coronaviruses, you don't have lifetime immunity. And so they were speculating, you know, if, if you only have three, four months immunity for this, you know, it, it obviously changes your entire projection of how this circles around the globe multiple times. You know, hopefully it is lifetime immunity, but we don't really know. One of my other colleagues had mentioned that uh, with SARS, they were working on the vaccine. Uh, they gave you know, whatever animal the vaccine and then re-expose them, then they had 100% mortality. And this is actually seen with a uh, dengue fever where your first exposure is a, a minimal infection. And when you the repeat exposure, it's a much more pronounced um, kind of bad scenario. So we haven't seen that. And definitely with the other countries, they've been around enough where we would have seen, you know, repeat, infections. And right now, the, the best thing that we have is a monkey study that shows that there, there is immunity. We don't know for how long. We're hoping it's lifetime. Well, that doesn't answer the question that probably a lot of our listeners have. It's like, when are we going to be immune so I can go back to my regular way of life, right? <laughs> and that's like a wait and see kind of an ail. I actually have a viewer question that came in. I missed it earlier, and I want to circle back to it before because I want to talk more about this testing, or I want you guys to talk more about testing. But this question says, should we redesign our hospitals for infectious diseases 
perhaps separate entrances? I mean, what kinds of things? Have you given much thought to any of that or is there much discussion about that? Yeah, so actually that's one thing that Singapore started and one thing that we've implemented is more or less the concept of a hospital within a hospital. So currently when someone comes to the emergency room, we are directing them to either the kind of the respiratory side or the non-respiratory side. You're coming in with a broken wrist, you're going in one direction, you're coming in with the fever and cough, you're going in another direction. Then we're testing for COVID. And if you are COVID, then we have dedicated floors for that. And we're trying to keep kind of the, the two populations as separate from each other as we possibly can. Now, whether this is a, a long-term solution for hospitals in general, I, I think time will tell, but definitely during this epidemic where we're seeing such a, a high volume, absolutely. But maybe that we need to rethink that of how we're dealing with flu. Dr. Amos, are you doing anything like that or thinking about that as you're talking, because you were talking about um, pregnancies and women having babies and those kinds of things. You must already be thinking some of this through, right? And, Right. Well, it, it, ideally, you have a separate floor for the pregnant mom who is uh, COVID positive. But um, you have to realize the limitations of hospitals. Not only if you're talking about small hospitals, if they have a limited number of beds, and then you have to look at staffing too. So those other variables come into play. So in the best case scenarios, yes, you would have complete separate floors, complete separate staff, just focused on infectious disease, on COVID positive patients. But the reality is that many times hospitals are small and the capacity to do so is not there. So that's oftentimes the limiting factor. Oh, absolutely. And especially in labor and delivery, you know, for the general hospital, you can separate out, you know, the folks with respiratory issues and non-respiratory issues. But a New York study pointed out that there's a, a large percentage of asymptomatic COVID patients and labor and delivery. And so that, that's a problem because they're all there for labor and delivery issues, but they might be asymptomatic, but yet COVID positive, and now you've just infected your staff. So it, it's, it's really a problem that is difficult to manage. And if you don't have the testing, almost impossible. If you're testing everyone that comes in the door for labor and delivery, it's a little bit easier, but even our tests are not perfect. The, you can, out of, you test 10 people and they're all negative, three of them still might be positive is how our test works. If you're positive, the test is pretty much, you know, 100% that you're positive. Mm -hmm. Well, testing seems to have been a huge problem, especially here in the United States. I mean, it seems like, I mean, from what we read, it's less of a problem in South Korea, for example, and more of a problem in other places, less of problems, you know, here and there. But how do you think we in the United States can increase testing or do we need to increase testing? And then the other question, I was reading an article, there's two different kinds of tests, right? One is whether you have it and then there's what, and I, I hope I pronounce it right, is serology testing. Yes. And then, you know, how do we know these tests are reliable? So, so the little bit I read to prep here, I mean, I read a lot, but I didn't understand all of it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that out to you. And Dr. Ramos, maybe you can start us off with that. Sure, yeah, so, so the testing, you know, as Dr. Richardson described, may not always be um, very accurate, but it's better than, than not knowing at all. And so going back to labor and delivery, the, the hope is, and, and we're going to be working for here in California, that 100% of all hospitals on labor and delivery who have a labor and delivery unit be testing all women who come uh, and are admitted for labor and delivery. So that's what we're working for. So in uh, response to your question about the serology, so serology is the blood test that is done uh, to assess if you have the antibodies. And we talked about going back to the herd immunity, the way that you know if you've been infected is to draw blood for antibodies. And we look to see if there are antibodies against the COVID-19 um, virus. Now, as, as Dr. Richardson had pointed out earlier, that doesn't mean that you are immune from uh, getting uh, COVID-19. Again, there's been some studies in, in Singapore that are showing that people are getting reinfected. So we don't know that there could be mutations that are happening, uh, but it's, it's better than nothing. So right now what is happening 
nationwide, and it's part of here specifically in California, um, to ramp up testing uh, more people to see have they been infected, are they infected, and right now the, the governor has aimed at testing 25,000 people a day. So they're increasing the number of testing. There's federal funding that is being provided to be able, be able to increase and ramp up the testing for, for everyone. So, yeah. No, I, I would completely agree. And one thing that we've been doing, which other places haven't, is using kind of both tests to help the limitations of one test because the serology test has limitations and then the what's called PCR polymer, polymerase chain reaction where you're actually looking for the RNA itself the virus itself and and they both have limitations and so by combining both of those you know maybe we're able to get things a little better but as i said nothing's perfect it i one of the one of the things that i read is that there's also sort of some skepticism with regard to the validity or the reliability of, of a number of the tests because there's little control over some of those serology tests at this point is that will that sort itself out fairly quickly do you think oh absolutely no i think right now we're primarily most of the serology test is coming from china it's not fda approved it's all under an emergency act and so the, the quality is not the best now as we're transitioning to Kind of the, the you know Beckman culture, the the main lab machines that are you know you'll find in a hospital laboratory. We're transitioning to those. Those claim to be having 100% sensitivity specificity, and if they're actually able to get tighter numbers to tell you exactly how much of the antibody you have, then obviously that's a lot better than the test that we're currently getting, which is a, a qualitative test to just say yes or no, but it doesn't give you. A, an idea of how much is actually there. With this next iteration, we'll be able to say how much is actually there, and that will be much more useful. So uh, when I go in, you know, you, if you get what you think is the flu, you go in and get tested. Uh, is it, 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 it seems like from what you, you hear, or what you read is that the COVID, if, we, if we're gonna experience another infection spike potentially, that it would come about the same time that a spike in the flu would come? Would this be the kind of thing where you would go in and test for, you just go in and take the swab and they'd say, you've got this, you don't have that and vice versa? Or... Yes, typically when we're running the test for the flu, we're running for a whole bunch of things. And I imagine that the COVID will just be one more thing run at the same time. Now, whether or not uh, COVID goes away a little bit during the summer, it, we have yet to see. Uh, Personally, I see that you know the south, southern hemisphere still has epidemics going on. So I'm not really convinced that we're going to see a decrease during the summertime just because of the summer weather. But as I said, it's a new virus, and we don't really know. Okay. And I think that's where the work on the immunization is most important. You know, just to get the immunization um, going and and developed. So. Um, that's where a lot of the, the innovation and, and really uh, camaraderie and collaboration is happening, which is fantastic. I, that, that actually, that last question that you both just responded to was a viewer question. I apologize, viewers. I want to make sure you know you're being heard out there. Uh, I do have another viewer question that you, you'd mentioned with regard to, um, to, to seeing spikes and those kinds of things. Uh, this viewer question says, our hospitals preparing for a second potential wave of cases as states reopen businesses. The highest surge in the rate of infection during the Spanish flu occurred when the curve occurred when the curve was flattened and business opened prematurely. So are we setting ourselves up for a similar kind of occurrence or what are your views on that? And I hope we're not setting ourselves up for the same thing, which is why it, it's really important to open slowly. And, you know, if we were just to drop everything and try and go back to where we were, you know, I would firmly believe that we would have a massive spike and we would overwhelm the hospital systems. But by trying to open slowly, and, you know, not wait too long to open, but open in a graded fashion and see how the population responds and how the hospitals are able to, to deal with everything. 
I think is the best way. And absolutely, the hospitals are preparing for you know resurgence. And when we start opening up on Friday, you know, two weeks after that, you know, we'll we'll be seeing how things go and responding appropriately. And, and Will it be? Go, excuse me, Dr. Amos, go ahead. Yeah, and, and I was just going to say, and I think the first time is always the hardest in trying to get the whole system set up. Um, I think hospitals and, and physicians have been through it once. And so it'll be, okay, it'll be just like last time. And I think adoption and implementation it will be not only faster, but much more efficient because we'll have a, a lot more um, information and the other thing too, to keep in mind is that, again, going back to the plan on opening up from Governor Newsom, that all of that information is being included in, in how we're gonna continue to open up as a state. No, absolutely, I completely agree. A, a lot of the things that the hospitals have done to prepare, you know, it was a black box initially and we're just really scrambling for information, but at this point, you know, China's gone through it, Italy's gone through it, New York's gone through it. We've had a lot of people before us, you know, work through these things. A lot of the hospitals have worked through their policies and procedures. We've acquired, you know, excess personal protective equipment that, you know, normally we wouldn't have a lot of N95s because we're typically just using it for tuberculosis or some other respiratory pathogens. Now we know that this is in our communities. We've, you know, more or less stockpiled that. And so, we won't be letting those stockpiles go away anytime soon. I think you're on mute, Doctor. I, you're on mute. All right, there you go. <laughs> All right, there you go. Well, you know, usually I have a whole staff in my studio. So, <laughs> you know, uh, you mentioned stockpiling and it made me think of the shortage of PPE and the masks kind of a stories. And now we have masks, the sort of the, the suggestion or the mandate in Orange County and across Southern California. And as much as anything, seeing people in masks or remembering to bring your own mask with you is a, a tangible reminder of the reality of, of the virus. And, you know, just because nobody around me has gotten sick doesn't mean it's not still out there, right? And, so one of the things I think about, and I, I really, I, I have to confess, I'm not the one who has been very bold to go out of the house to do the shopping or pick things up. Uh, are the grocery stores safe? I mean, should we, should we be leaving the house period as, you know, should, do we have other options we should be taking advantage of? Or what are your thoughts on that? I'll ask Dr. Ramos first to respond to this. So being the one that actually goes out to the grocery store, <laughs> I would say yes. Um, I, I think going out with precautions and just, you know, re-emphasizing the safety precautions for, for everything, Wh whether you're going to the supermarket, whether you're going to drop off mail, whatever it is, just following the recommendations of washing your hands right now with using the mask, uh, avoid touching your face if somebody's sick. They should be the ones to stay home and trying to avoid touching any surfaces. You know, definitely um, they're safe. Also, I, I think it's more worrisome for the uh, employees at the grocery store because you heard so many cases that occurred because they were not being protected. And so now with everyone wearing the face mask, you've got to realize that the face mask protects other people. It's not to protect you, it's to protect other people from from you. So now they're more protected and they're also wearing the face mask and they have the plexiglass, um, you know, dividing the, the buyer from, from the uh, cashier. So yeah, I, I would say they're, they're safe now. When you get home, the other, you know, you hear people saying, well, I don't take, bring my groceries in and I wipe it off with Clorox uh, wipes and just to make sure that the disinfectant We've heard so many stories how long the COVID-19 virus can last on, on carton, you know, but in general, yes, they're safe. Just remember, wash your hands, <laughs> cover your mouth, and, and just follow the, the safety precautions. What, what, about, what about wearing gloves? I, I would say go ahead, wear gloves, but the gloves give you a false sense of security. And so uh, when you wear gloves, you may think, oh, well, I can touch that or I can touch my face now and you just 
you know, your hands were touching everything and now you touched your face that defeated the whole purpose <laughs> of you trying to be cautious. So, so it, it can be a little bit challenging, you know, and I've had patients who told me, oh yeah, I was wearing gloves, but then I realized I touched my hair and my face and it was pointless <laughs> to wear the gloves. So yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not an easy uh, adjustment to make, but hopefully we'll all gain good habits from trying to avoid touching our, our faces and our eyes. So. Mm -hmm. no, I agree. And the one thing I would just say is, you know, everything's about, you know, risks and benefits and trying to, you know, mitigate the, the risks and increase your benefits. And to that, you know, the, the having, you know, younger, healthier folks in the family go out and do the shopping is probably a lot better than you know, I would keep folks over 65 that have heart disease and, you know, breathing problems. You know, I would keep them more sheltered. But for you know, folks under 50 with no medical issues, I, I think you're, you're pretty safe. Dean, I'm sorry, I think you're still on mute. I thought I fixed it, sorry. Mm -hmm. Do you, you know, you, I'm sure you are keeping track of the protests in Santa Monica all across the US over protective equipment for the medical community, do you expect that supply to improve? Has have things gotten markedly better or where are we at in that whole thing? And I just touched my face. I realized that. <laughs> <laughs> so things have gotten markedly better. Again, that goes to how we are going to be opening up. So part of the criteria is having that personal protective equipment available for um, healthcare providers. And you know that that is becoming more and more available. Again, going back to the business portion of of what uh, we are here at uh, Paul Mirage is just seeing how one how quickly companies have have switched over to producing um, the, the the gear necessary to help protect patients to help protect providers. And and so again, just, I, I think it's, uh, we're there, we're getting there, we're getting better. As Dr. Richardson described, he, his system is not getting rid of all of the N95 masks that they've acquired as a result of, of uh, COVID-19, but we're, um, we're, we're, much, we're much better. Absolutely, and I would say that, you know, the initial shock to the system, you know, everyone is more or less, you know, quote unquote, hoarding. So you're, you're trying to go from, I have a week supply of N N95s at a usage level that is, you know, one-tenth of what I need to, now I have 14 weeks of, you know, ample, you know, realistic usage. Well, you're not going to keep, you know, buying at that capacity. And so the supply chain, you know, now is, as we've, you know, segregated and sheltered in place, the supply chain is catching up. So I think we're every day we're getting better. And similarly with the testing to kind of go back on that, you know, every day it's just been an exponential growth. And so it's, it's continues to get better. Uh, I am, um, uh, these are all, these are viewer questions. I'm, I apologize to the viewers if I don't specifically state that they're just coming, kind of coming in and I'm asking them because I, I'm compelled. They're really good questions. How do you, how do you respond to the proposition that the cure is more impactful than the problem? Mm -hmm. Studies show that these effects can be quantified and in many cases significantly outweigh the benefits. So this is obviously, we're asking people who are on the front lines, what do you think about the, the, the trade-off here, the trade-offs? I, I, you know, there's obviously a lot of political con connotations in there and I don't know that I really want to go there, but I, I think that you know, when the United Nations is suggesting that our, our next big problem is going to be famine because of everything that globally we've instituted around the world, uh, that's not a small problem that we're going to be dealing with. And, you know, there are unintended consequences. We've, we focused on, you know, COVID, which we absolutely need to do. And I, I for one, am very grateful for what Californians have given up and allowed the hospitals and, you know, medical community to catch up and you know, increase testing, increase our PPE supply. Uh, and it's a huge blessing and people have sacrificed a lot for that. But at the same time, uh, you know, we need to kind of get people back on their feet and get them you know, moving along because poverty is devastating and folks not being able to eat, the, all the kids that rely on school meals 
Um, these things have to be addressed and we got to make sure that our society is taken care of, not just from COVID, but from all the different you know, social ills that we have going on. Yeah, and I would say, um, you know, likewise, it's really important to realize, okay, weigh the risks and the benefits and how can we push us to, to move forward and to uh, go back to whatever the new normal is going to be. Um, again, I, I think it's all gonna be changing um, in terms of face masks, in terms of, of hygiene. And so to start adopting and promoting all of the new normal, I think it's gonna be important for us to get back, back to, um, to open business and to help support everyone. But using the precautions that we talked about, and right, yeah, and yeah. and being prepared. So I have another another question then to that to that uh, idea because a lot of the what uh, this is a viewer question, and it's prompted I think by seeing these protests that people want to, uh, things to have open up. What do you, what do the two of you think? Will those protests create or or create a spike in the COVID cases in the near future? They have the potential to or. I would say, you know, any large gathering has the potential to see a lot of concerts. Those are on phase four of you know, the, the California's plan to reopen. Opening Disneyland is, you know, similar. Any any large gathering is going to have an issue. But if we maintain our social distance and you know, wear masks, be able to mitigate those risks, then and those are good things. But at the same time, I can understand why folks are protesting when, you know, as I said, you have folks in poverty living paycheck to paycheck. My understanding from a while ago was, you know, people, a lot of folks only had $100 and any kind of emergency, they were going to be underwater. Well, here we've had people not working or doing anything for six weeks. So, I mean, there, I, I have to imagine, and I have no data, that there's a lot of folks that are really hurting out there. Dr. Ramos? Yeah, so in terms of, of seeing the protests and the gathering, well, depending upon, again, just practicing, yes, they're, they're not uh, perhaps doing the social distancing, but by the ones that I drove by, they had masks on and, you know, some of them had gloves on as long as they weren't touching their face. I think it, you just see the frustration that, that everyone is starting to go through. Um, and I think and the hope is that know that there aren't going to be any more increase in um, in rates of, of COVID-19 infection. Um, but overall, it's just really a, ref a reflection of the frustration that all of society is starting to feel after being, um, you know, on, on, on just on these regulations and um, the sheltering in place. So mm -hmm. again, at this week, this is when it's supposed to happen, starting on Friday. Hopefully we'll start, start to see the change. I heard that some of the beaches here in Orange County, a couple of them are, are gonna open this weekend. So we'll start to transition and everyone will start to undergo whatever the new normal is gonna be. Well, I'm getting a lot more questions here. Here's another viewer question. A lot of our loved ones uh, can be 90 plus and in great health. What should their weekly, what should their weekly routine look like? So, I mean, it's, and, and I love to take this first because I have a lot of friends who have elderly uh, parents and really it's important to keep them safe, <laughs> stay at home. And um, oftentimes, you know, if, if you have the ability, even if you're in a nursing home to, um, to read, to do, uh, keep connected with your loved ones, whether it's through Skype, through FaceTime, that's really important to have that connect connectedness. The other thing too is to move. I can't emphasize that enough. One of my big other big initiatives is just um, health and something as simple as dancing. You know, you can put on your favorite song and just move and dance. That gets the endorphins going, that gets you to feel good. It just changes your mood all, all around. Um, so yeah, those would be my big tips is for, for the 90 year old is to make sure that we keep in touch with, with our loved ones. We look in on them, provide them with um, a, a lot of love, however it may be, and keep them moving mentally and, and physically. 
Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. You know, that's a very at-risk population that we want to continue to shelter in place, but at the same time, we need to make sure that they're getting their exercise and not, you know, being completely debilitated. And so it's going to be that fine balance of trying to get find those indoor exercises. So, so a, 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 a viewer question on the other end of the spectrum then, um, can you talk a little bit more about how we could safely achieve herd immunity? And the question here is, is there a case to be made for sending our younger population out into the world or to gathering groups in the coming months? And this is really relevant to starting up class again, right? And what does a college campus look like? No, yeah, I, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Richardson. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I, the folks that I would want to be out and about would be the folks least at risk, and that's going to be the younger population. Now, the problem of uh, starting school, uh, K through 12, is the fact that a lot of those kids are probably going to come home back to grandma or, or, you know, other folks, and so that's going to be a problem. Now, the college folks, you know, between 18 and, you know, 22 or something, who are living on a dorm that aren't going to be bringing that back to, you know, grandma and grandpa, maybe that's a safer population. I don't know. It, we'll see what uh, the folks at the state level all work through. Yeah, and, and I just want to uh, repeat a great comment that you actually made, Dean, on, I think it was during um, the, the happy hour meeting, that it's actually going to be the, the professors who are at high risk in colleges. It's not the students, it's keeping the, the faculty safe because, you know, they're, they're maybe at, at higher risk. So, oh, we lost you. Dean, I think you're on mute again. See, yeah, okay, well, I'm in that risk group. My <laughs> memory's going. I keep forgetting to do undo the mute. Uh, do you have any uh, advice for uh, addressing, how uh, strengthening the immune system? That was another viewer question for, for all of us, but I suppose. No, absolutely. I think it's all the things that we all know that we all never do. You know, getting good exercise, good nutrition, good sleep, uh, minimizing stress. I mean, we, we all know what really healthy is. Um, it's just, we don't, we don't tend to do what we know is the right for us. You know, and, and the other thing too, just to highlight is that right now with, with COVID-19, there's been a, an upsurge of so many apps and websites with um, meditation, with recommendations on how to decrease your stress. And so we actually may have the time right now to listen to a podcast, to look at an app and start to implement. So if we started this when, when the shelter in place started a month ago, it would already be a habit. So, you know, just a, continuing the habits that we started as a result of this, I, I think would be, would be a, a good thing for all of our health, you know, in addition to what we already know we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And I think, Dr. Ramos, one of the things you said is going to be critical to everyone that for the older folks that we were talking about is just having that connection and feeling, you know, checked in on and checking in on each other and caring and cared for and caring for others is probably critical, right? Right. But, Absolutely. Um, we are social. I, I have, go ahead, Dr. Phil Richardson. No, I was just going to say we're, we're, we are social. That's our human nature is to be social and, and uh, you know, what do we do with prisoners? We put them in isolation and you know, that's not what we need. We need to have that human connection. Yeah, and that's torture to be in isolation. You're right. I didn't thought of it that, that way. Do you, uh, do either of you, what are your thoughts on international travel and the possibility of that happening in 2020? I yes. know we don't have a crystal ball, but. So, so I was actually supposed to be giving a lecture in Taiwan in February. <laughs> So the Taiwan uh, OBGYN Society said, sorry, we have to cancel. And I know that the, uh, the residential for the, uh, you know, for the EMBA students has been canceled. Uh, and I, I really, so personally, because I do a lot of international traveling, um, it really is going to be a, a, a wait and see type of thing. Um, I have um, some colleagues that were stuck in, in uh, Belize uh, as, as volunteers and they couldn't get back to the US because flights were, flights were canceled. 
and not only coming into the U.S., but just flights leaving out of the countries. Uh, so I really think it's going to be a wait and see, not just for the open borders, but more importantly for the testing and just to see what, what the uh, fall is going to be bringing in terms of caseload. Uh, um, I have another question here. I don't know which one of you feels like you'd want to tackle it first, but uh, it's asked what thoughts, what, do you, what impact will the high unemployment rate get, give health, will have on having health care, the rise in Obamacare, will patients come in with more advanced disease because of their inability to incur health care costs? There's three questions there. Somebody got three out of one, so. Mm -hmm. So thoughts on any of those? So interestingly enough, I, I found it very amazing that with the 2008 uh, economic crisis, we actually saw an increase in utilization of healthcare services. And I don't know if that was just because folks lost their job and they still had COBRA and decided that they wanted to get things done while they still had COBRA. But I think this is going to be very different because right now we're seeing people don't want to come to the hospital. People are not coming in with chest pain with a small heart attack. They're coming in with you know very late stage heart attack, very late stage stroke. And I don't know that that's going to be changing in the you know general population perception anytime quickly. So it, it is a problem. And when you know six months after Cobra runs out, uh, it, it's going to be very challenging for a lot of folks. Yeah, the unemployment, uh, you know, unfortunately, and the unemployment is, is tied with oftentimes with, with health insurance. And so really, it, it will be very interesting to see the impact on the safety net that we have in terms of, of health care. And that's where preventive services are really going to be critical to be emphasized and to be provided. Um, here in Orange County, we have um, a few FQHCs that patients can can go to for for health care but it it is going to have to be addressed um and i would and i would push us to do so in an innovative way just like we have adopted telemedicine to push us to come up with an innovative way of how do we address this gap how can we we fill in um, the safety net you know with a new version of, of health care that we now have as telemedicine what can be continued to provide care to all of those folks? You know, and I'd like to come back to that if we have enough time, but I have a viewer question, I think, and I'm pretty sure this is for Dr. Ramos. My wife is seven months pregnant. Are you giving specific recommendations to pregnant women in, with regard to sheltering in place, especially in light of moving into phase two? So really important is to follow your obstetrician, or your healthcare provider's directions. Uh, and attend your prenatal care. Many prenatal care visits right now are virtual. Okay. And so make sure that they keep their, their prenatal care because there may be some complications that may arise as a result of that prenatal care visit that may require for her to go in uh, to the hospital or to be evaluated. So keep the prenatal care, follow your recommendations of your doctor. And in terms of delivery, each hospital has uh, different recommendations as to how they are going to be managing the visitors, um, the delivery. So really check with the hospital to see what their policies are so that you can understand and, and not be surprised by what the hospital is going to be asking of, of that patient. Okay. I, I want to ask one thing. Uh, I, I thought it would be interesting to tie tonight's this is not a viewer question, this is my question, and I thought about tonight's session, tie it back to the opening of the speaker series, which you highlighted the impact of COVID on the homeless population. And I'm really curious to know how you see COVID affecting disenfranchised communities like these, whether it's access to testing or treatment or a higher rate of spread. I mean, what, uh, and I know that we don't have much time, but maybe you could provide a little bit of insight there. So, yes, yeah, so I'll start. So I think um, what this is doing, what COVID-19 is doing, is really just uh, reminding us of the disparities that there are in the homeless population, in, in whatever other population uh, you want to talk about, whatever the underlying health conditions that may disproportionately be affecting those populations. 
the COVID is just reminding us of, wow, well, this patient doesn't have insurance, they have pre-existing conditions, they're doing worse, they're the ones that are dying. And so it just reminds us of the work that we need to continue to do to continue to provide um, health care at all levels to all, all women, all men and children here um, in, in Orange County and, and in our health care system. I, I absolutely agree. And that, you know, this really is public health. You know, we're all in this together. If we allow a segment of our, our population to you know, have COVID, it, it's going to spread to all of us. And so we need to, you know, step up and we need to take care of each other. And it, we're really all in this together. We can't be thinking, oh, well, that, this is just a, an X problem or a Y problem. You know, we're all in this and we need to make sure that we, we all have good access to healthcare and are able to get treatment. Because as, as you mentioned, if in six months from now, we have a lot of folks that are uninsured and they don't feel like, oh, well, I just have a little cough and cold, no big deal, where if they could come to us and we could, you know, get them treatment and minimize the infection being spread to other folks, you know, that, that's critical. So we really need to take care of everyone. Do either of you have any closing comments before I close with a thank you? I'll just say thank you so much for your time and having, having us on. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. And I do wanna put a, a promotion that I, I've just developed a game that highlights um, all of the coronavirus.gov recommendations on keeping safe. It's called covidblast.com. And so that's part of the, um, the, the innovation center of the Wayfinder, the Cove. So thank you to- And so anybody who's watching this, we will follow up and send a link to that, right? I'm sure that my, my listening crew is going to make sure that we get that link sent out. I just wanna say thank you very much to both Dr. Diana Ramos and Dr. Philip Richardson. It's really, we're just so lucky to have uh, resources like this in the Mirage community. And, and your people who are very busy, very, uh, very under stress on a day to day basis because you're really on the front lines with this. And just thank you very much for taking the time uh, out of your days, your respective days to. Uh, to fill us in, alleviate a little bit of, of our consternation, and also just uh, tell us tell us how we can um, how we can best cope with the the things that are facing us. And I guess uh, um, I guess I, the one thing I'll remember is uh, dirty gloves are worse than clean hands, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate both of you, uh, and um, the Mirage community is very lucky. And I, I look forward to future uh, conversations like this. And I will see all of you in some way, shape or form down the road. And I hope in person, if not sooner, healthy later, okay? So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank both of you tonight.